Okay, great. So let's, uh, I want to, I'm very curious to see the product that you have and, uh, and uh, please go ahead and give us like a little demo. It's, I'm, I'm excited to see it. Sure. Um, love to. So um, this is a service we launched last year. It's free at the moment. Uh, this is free and always will be. And you can think of it as a directory of a curated collection of APIs with meaningful data associated with it. So um, the landing category is corporate infrastructure. This is basically the top 20 APIs everybody uses day to day. Uh, we have links to the developer sites. You can see at a glance if they've had problems in the last week, if failures have occurred. But what we're looking at is we're doing uh, actual calls against live production accounts every um, typically five minutes from different data centers around the world in the cloud. And then we're blending that data together to form a pattern of how good the API is. Is that so if you think about the, the yeah. frequency of calls you're making, is that configurable? Yeah, you, you can set it to whatever you like. We found, to be honest, for what we do, it, it's, it doesn't need to be super high frequency. And you're not trying to break the service you're trying to build up a random pattern of a of performance. And what, what we do is, because we're, we're a cloud agnostic platform, we're, we're up on all of the data centers um, for the four major clouds. We're working on getting up on Alibaba. We also have for customers, uh, specialist data centers in hard to reach locations. So uh, we do monitor from China for certain customers, New Zealand and others. The Key thing we realized very early on though, was um, you could look at a metric like pass rate, you could look at latency, and in and of themselves, you could say, I've got a great latency, my API is fantastic, or we have a great pass rate, our API is fantastic, but it doesn't tell the whole story. So we created uh, a system that we've patented called CASC, CASC, and it stands for Cloud API Service Consistency. What we do there is we blend all the metrics together um, using some an AI tools we've built using Donut and some other technologies to detect outliers. And what we're looking for is how consistent is the response to your API. So yes, we look at did it pass and not just did it give a 200, but did it give you what you expected? Because we get quite a lot of 200 failures. And then was the, out, was the median consistent or was in fact it all over the place and very spiky? So this allows us to do pretty much like for like comparisons between different APIs. And the good, the good news for big corporate APIs from companies know what they're doing is they're all pretty good. Um, we say anything above an eight is very, is good. Anything above nine is very good. And we very rarely see these APIs dip. They, they, they are consistent. They are well built, uh, but you'll notice they don't always have a hundred percent uptimes. Um, some are four nines, some are three nines, some are only two nines. And on our free site, you can look at the last week, the last month, or even go and look at all of 2020's data. What so I think interesting is uh, your, your CASC metric, because you're right, like um, it is a very regular habit for people to measure API health by technical metrics like performance, uh, latency, uh, response time, et cetera. But this interestingly for me is like a composition of metrics, right? Is that what it is? Like yeah, I think of it more like a, a credit score than than necessary just a help than a um, so, single metric. So, for example, if I'm a bank, um, one of the things that I also care about is business impact, um, and so this could be an interesting uh, an, an interesting derivation could be to go towards business impact uh, when you're measuring. So that's interesting. So, so we're working on some uh, extensions of the product to allow you to import metadata from all your transactions, so you could blend it with um, poor performance from different locations. So if you know you had 25,000 calls from a location that's slow, you know what the impact of that is. If okay. you only had 10 calls, you'll, you'll be able to say, well, that's not that important. Right. So this is cool because it's public. It's based on public APIs. And I'm looking at there's a bunch of, uh, you know, bank APIs here. So I'm assuming that you have called into um, bank API calls, actual bank API call. Yes, yeah, so th this is a really interesting data set and something we, we're looking to push, um, create and curate more of. These are actual um, UK open banking API calls we've, we've done in conjunction with a partner, Fractal Labs. Um, UK open banking is extremely um, secure. Uh, it uses multi-part authentication, OAuth plus a um, one-time issued uh, JSON signing 
certificate that's then kept it has to be kept in an encrypted store it's very hard to actually make calls and and we've, we've been through the process of onboarding 30 plus institutions so we can monitor at the very least their consent flows and where you see a little green person here we're actually monitoring a bank account so we've we've got a bank account that we are going and looking at um they call them the aisp calls but they're, they're the first layer of um, account information but this is an interesting data set because these are all the same. Essentially, they're all the same API. They so are that's interesting. So you could actually have a vertical benchmark. You could have a, yeah. a banking benchmark, banking industry. We, benchmark. we know exactly what they are. They're all the same. They're regulated to be the same. They have metrics that they must achieve. And yet the quality range is quite spectacular. So everything <laughs> from... Um, a 4.8 for creation cards on their authentication server through to uh, Danske Bank, who is solidly in the nines. Let's go, Dan. All right, Danske has got their stuff together. They uh, have, but uh, creation is an interesting one. Just so creation offers store cards. Their authentication wow. server is very unreliable as we measure it. We get a lot of outliers, a lot of performance drift, but their actual APIs are pretty good. Um, I think I just saw them here. Yeah, they're at 13 out of um, 14. Yeah, yeah. So this is, a this is a great example of where they're probably missing the problems because if you just look at the the data that they will see, everything is fine. People actually making queries against the production APIs, everything's going well. The fact is though, it's yeah, you five know, percent of the time you have a really crappy experience signing into the service through the API, oh, and that that's is a problem that. These are the problems that tend to get missed with APIs. Yes. And, yes. and then what we can do is actually, I'll pick another example because uh, we know what we know roughly what the issue is here. Um, so if I go and look at um, uh, B Bank, uh, I'm not sure who B Bank are, but you'll see we have um, a 30% outlier rate. And what is happening is we actually are having a lot of slow calls from different data centers, except for IBM Cloud. And we've actually, we've, we've informed them of this, that there's something misconfigured that 50% of their calls work if they're from AWS, Azure, or Google, but the other 50% kind of get stuck in an infosec loop. But again, if you're not looking from the outside in across multiple clouds, you will not see these problems. Everything will look fine from the point of view of your gateway. Right. Apogee, MuleSoft, whomever will say, no, everything's fine. Right. This is this is the kind of thing that the outside in approach gives you. So this is free data. Anybody can go and look at it. But what we're about to launch um, as a paid service that every, anybody can have is uh, essentially API metrics for um, the data sets, but actually getting into the, the, meat, the meat behind it. So you'll actually be able to look at how we generated the data and go into a particular account. So uh, you could go into an Adobe, you could go into uh, Microsoft Graph. And what I'll do is quickly just go to an account. Um, you could actually, you will actually be able to go into, um, this is Microsoft Office 365, but you actually able to see the domains that are being called. You'll be able to see the actual calls themselves. You'll even be able to go into our statistical engine and see how the cast score is generated and see what could be done to improve things or why we're why we're marking things down. You won't be able to get to the, the you won't be able to get to anything that gives away trade secrets, you won't be able to get to individual results, but you'll be able to see trend analysis and data on a huge variety of APIs that you may rely on or work with, all coming in through um, a simple uh, a single interface from uh, the API expert pr platform. So this is where we're going. And it's the first part of a series of tools where we, we're calling it, we're probably going to call something around uh, like observant. But the idea is it's to give non-engineers full transparency and observability into their DevOps stack, not just for their own products, but all the products they rely on need to have an SLA on or could potentially impact their business. And that's what we're trying to bring essentially out of uh, out of engineering and into the boardroom. Yeah, yeah, I like it. And uh, so let's talk architecture for a second, a little technical, but if, sure. I, if, I'm a, if I'm a bank or if I'm an enterprise, I have workloads on various clouds, I have workloads on-premise, 
Um, I have workloads on hyperconverged infrastructure, et cetera. Uh, maybe some partner organizations have workloads. And so I want to, and, and my application footprint is spread across all of that. So there's going to have to be different flexibility in deployment models. Um, and so talk to me about um, deploying this uh, to accommodate for a, a hybrid multi-cloud environment. So, so to a certain extent, we're treating uh, all of the APIs we call a, as a black box. They, they are, you know, the endpoint is the discrete node that we're going for. So our system doesn't work. Um, it doesn't work out of the box for in-house only resources. So you can't, you can't go in and type local host and set up a call. And it was, that was something it took us a long time to understand about the mindset of developers, that we were shocked to find how many developers had never made a call to their API resource from outside their desktop. So there's a lot of inexperience, even in development com communities around how API security works. So that's one thing. One thing we, we do is we, we, we force people to, can you actually call your, uh, call your service from outside? Our system is cloud-based. Um, we, we have a single um, data center where everything gets stored and um, analyzed at the moment. We, we can redeploy that for um, GDPR requirements or other local needs to a particular geography or a particular location. But if you're, do, if you're talking about analyzing where the data comes from, uh, you, we run uh, 85 at the moment different data center on 85 different data centers. Now, our agents like a mini application server. So when you set up your call or series of calls, it random and schedule it to run on a regular basis, it randomly gets sent out to that data center, queued up, it goes off and executes the call, and then it sends back the data to our AI and ML systems to analyze it and produce the st statistical models for it. So to a certain extent, we, we're, we're completely agnostic about where you are and how you're built, but we can do interesting things like tell you where in the world is fastest. So yeah, we can actually say, at the moment, you the, anybody calling you from AWS Virginia gets a better gets 300 milliseconds better performance than AWS San, um, California. And that's the kind of thing that's also very hard for people to see because there's a lot of focus in cloud monitoring tools on cost, but very little on, well, what does that do to my latency? So people will move a Kubernetes in implementation to save five cents an instance by going to Chicago. But what if that costs you 120 milliseconds per transaction? Was it worth the five cents per instance to slow everything down by 100 milliseconds? And these are the questions I don't think people are asking yet because they're just not thinking of them. But yeah. our system's designed to allow you to echo what's happening in the real cross multi-cloud, multi-homed world. Yeah, and what I like is that, you know, you're hovering above different vendor, uh, the gateways, different vendor specific, um, you know, silos. And, and load balancers. You're abstracting yeah. above and load balancers. So that's cool. So then tell me <clears throat> who is, the audience of your product, um, and where can this go in the future in terms of uh, you know uh, business uh, conversations, like in business applicability? Yeah. So um, most of our customers are actually uh, engineering managers outside of the the day to day delivery chain of building an API. Um, I'd say less than ten percent of our customers are actually day to day developers of APIs. Uh, most of our customers are their boss, bosses or their boss's boss or their boss's boss's boss. And um, we, we need to come up for, for a word for these people. But um, they're heads of open banking. They are CIOs. They are um, infrastructure, global infrastructure managers. They are CTO office. They are digital transformation leaders. And we have a non-trivial number who are customer success managers because they feel the pain of being caught between DevOps and customers. And nobody really wants to be told that there's a problem by a customer, turn around to DevOps and ask what the problem is and be told there's no problem. And that's a um, that, that, that's kind of core to what we're seeing is we, we, need, to, we need to come up industry-wide with a way of describing these API consumers who are actually paying for the services to be built um, it's almost like they, 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 they are paying people to make the sausage, but they want to eat the sausage and they don't really care how it was made. Yeah. And we, we look after the people making the sausages and cooking them, but the people in the restaurant tend to get what they're given. 
and we I think we need to change that and come up with with ways of handling that process. Yeah, the analog I, that comes to my mind is, you know, the people that are paying, they, you know, if you were to look at product development, they are specifying the Jira stories. After that, engineers go and make it. Engineers have their own metrics, but it comes back to you know tracking your progress and product development on, on Jira. Um, and, and, and a similar in the, in the API world, um, it goes straight to engineers doing their tracking, but there are no equivalent of business stories uh, around API. So I can see what you're saying. So that makes a lot of sense. And, and I think if you, if you look at the world uh, up until very recently, that, the, that was fine for how people consumed APIs, but now you have regulators who are actually saying, well, your service must meet this. We are regulating that your service must work this way. And they are having disputes between parties who both say the other is lying and somebody is not. Um, and then we look at you know, things that are emerging in the future. Um, co post COVID travel will be reliant on rapid ability to get access to people's passport status, their COVID vaccination status, and have trusted metrics that can be delivered in real time when someone's crossing a border, when they're trying to book an airline ticket. Um, now, there are ways that this could be done with blockchain, but at some point, it's going to have to, there will be queries of real time information that needs to be updated. And that has to work. And everybody has to know if it doesn't.